I'm Tim Clark and this is Conversations about the Vietnam War. My guest today is John Walker who was in the 173rd Airborne Brigade of the U.S. Army. And so John, uh, in this conversation what we'd like to do is discover how you were transformed from a civilian uh, into uh, someone in service in a combat zone and then uh, um, um, how that transformed you in terms of helping you stay on target for your long-range plan of what you wanted to do with your life. Okay. So uh, the beginning point, I guess, would be um, uh, high school. What was your high school experience? Well, I went to two different high schools. I went to a small school, Stevenson, Washington, until I was 16. Uh, some things happened, and I, was, I moved to a place called R.A. Long in Longview, Washington. And uh, I graduated from there. I went my junior and senior year there. And what year? I graduated in 1969. Okay. Now, uh, you mentioned to me that uh, even at that time, now clearly by this point the uh, role of the United States military in Vietnam has become a much more aggressive role. Mm -hmm. And uh, the draft was now clearly taking in many more people. And uh, so that was something that every young, healthy male in America was, was facing. Uh, but you uh, chose to go to school. What, what were you attempting to do and where? Uh, I went to Central, back in the day, it was Central Washington uh, College, State College. No, Central Washington, yeah, Central Washington State College. And my goal was always to be in education, which uh, was my primary goal. And once I got back from the military, it was the goal that I set for myself and, and uh, worked to uh, reach. All right, but uh, you didn't have a lot of family resources to do that. How did you? Well, I had no family resources. Uh, what happened is I went to the to high school, graduated, got a job on the section crew, which is railroad work, replacing ties, doing rail work, made just enough to uh, go to one year college. But again, college back at that time was $2,500 a year. So I made almost to the dollar enough to go to school. I had no extra money at all, just primarily school money. So when we talk about starving students, you know exactly what that means. Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, uh, then eventually a draft notice showed up, is that correct? Uh, I went through the, the things that an 18-year-old does. I registered for the draft. I received no draft notice. I volunteered for the draft. All right, so uh, when and uh, what was the process that you went through? The process I went through is I notified my draft board that I wanted to volunteer for the draft. That happened, happened in April of 1970. Uh, of course, they, they needed people, so they asked me to come down April of 1970. Uh, the, the quarter that I was working on did not end until June, so I wrote them back and told them, I need to have the ability to come in in June, uh, report for the military in June. Got out of college uh, the 5th, hitchhiked home, dropped my stuff off, uh, rode the bus to Portland, Oregon, and I was inducted into the military on the 7th. And almost immediately you were relocated uh, by the military to where? Uh, did my basic an advanced infantry training in uh, Fort Campbell, South Carolina. Okay. And uh, so most people go through uh, basic and then some specialized training. Mm -hmm. What type of specialized training were you in? I was in uh, infantry training. Okay. And uh, what types of things did they specifically give you as a skill set in that type of training? Um, of course, most of it was the use of weapons, uh, what you would do in certain situations that were combat related, uh, basic, basic logistics, uh, compass use, map use, uh, things like that. But the primary focus for me that I remember was the use of weapons when uh, or if I went to a war zone. 
Okay, now somehow you ended up in Airborne. How did that all work? I was sitting in a training session in, the, in uh, AIT and they asked if anybody wanted to go to uh, Airborne, which at the time I didn't know what, what, what it was, and uh, nobody raised their hand, so I did. And they cut orders, that's what they do, is they cut orders. And when I got out of advanced infantry training, I went to airborne school. All right, where was that and what was different about that training? Uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, primarily basic parachuting techniques and a great deal of physical training. All right, now, did they talk about helicopters as a primary part of that? Uh... No, helicopters were an option. You could do uh, jumps out of helicopters. I parachuted out of a C-141, which at the time was a jet that they could slow down enough to have a platoon-sized unit uh, jump out. The helicopters you could parachute out of, uh, the Air Mobile that I dealt with in Vietnam came later. Okay. Uh, so eventually uh, 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 you're, uh, you ended up uh, being uh, literally sh uh, shipped towards Vietnam. Uh, uh, you had to be assigned to a specific unit. You ended up in 11 Bravo, is that correct? I was, that's my classification. The unit I was serving with was the 173rd Airborne Brigade, and that was located in the central high, highlands of Vietnam. Okay, and uh, when did you arrive in Vietnam? And uh, Christmas Eve, I think it was. And transportation, where'd you come from and where'd you oh, go to? Oh, I'm sorry. I came from uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, went to McCord, flew from McCord to Anchorage, Anchorage to Japan, Japan to Cameron Bay. And then from Cameron Bay, uh, I was in a area, kind of a staging area, and then uh, they readied us for our unit, gave us our specific assignments, and uh, then we were shipped off. All right, and where did that put you? When you were shipped off, uh, you were relocated with uh, uh, other units uh, in the Central Highlands? Well, if they were there, I didn't know about them because I was 19 years old. Uh, the ones I knew about, I went to the 173rd. We were at On K, which was a very large fire base in the Central Highlands. We were pulling uh, guard duty at the time uh, prior to turning the fire base over to the Arvins, which is the Army of Republic of Vietnam. All right, so uh, it's a totally American-run base at that period of time? Yes, and other, yes, uh, yes. Okay, and in a fire base, uh, I assume the, the standard organization is there are units in the field, units that are in supply, and then obviously artillery support. Uh, Correct. What type of what type of artillery did you have around? Well, I'm sure that the well, of course, they had mortars, uh, larger mortars than the the bigger guns, 155s, uh, you know, on up or on down, whatever it happened to be. And then around a fire base, what they used the mortars for is they would fire up uh, illumination rounds, which would float down with a parachute in order to illuminate the. Uh, perimeter. All right, so uh, did this happen uh, nightly or just when there was a suspected activity? Uh, if I remember correctly, it was nightly. Okay, so just that's... It, because you had uh, specific distances, you had guard towers that uh, you would have manned uh, in order to protect the fire base. The fire base uh, was a resupply area, mail, uh, place for the people who were in the field to come back and get a short break from the actual day-to-day uh, -day grind that you get in when you're in the field. Okay, you talked about a landing zone uplift. Right. Is that located in the same area? It was in the same core, three core, the Central Highlands. I moved from more central of Vietnam, if you can think of Vietnam as that, kind of like that. I was in the center, I moved more towards the coast and we started to operate out of there. Okay, now was that because of the need to interdict uh, uh, troop movements or simply more enemy activity? What? No, the reason we moved, as I mentioned earlier, we uh, were turning the fire base, the large fire base at An Khe, over to the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. And so we moved to um, LZ Uplift, which was very close to the city of Quinh Yan and Phu Thai. 
Now, you also mentioned that uh, for about six months there, you were basically dealing with missions and you distinguish them between search and destroy. What's the difference and what goes on? Well, as far as I know, search and destroy would move out into the field and they would try to make contact. During the time that I was out there, uh, we did not go out of our way to make contact with the enemy. We made contact with the enemy, but it was kind of a mutual oops. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, and is there a different makeup? Is there, uh, the, the folks in the field are no longer the local uh, bred Viet Cong. They're uh, 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 units that are, in fact, uh, unified and trained out of North Vietnam? Uh, I never ask them. No. <laughs> uh, the people I dealt with probably were VC. Okay. Now, whether they were locally trained or trained in North Vietnam, I don't know. Uh, but the, the people I dealt with were the Viet Cong. Okay. Uh, so uh, you're, uh, when you were actually located out in the field, mm -hmm. how did you get there? How long were you there? Uh, we were air mobile. We would fly out by helicopter to a specific spot. They, uh, we could be out there anywhere from four days to a couple weeks. Is the way it, that was the rotation when I was over there. Most of mine were between uh, oh, eight days and maybe twelve days. The, the uh, pieces out in the field. And again, you know, being nineteen years old, it's hard for me to remember uh, specifics like that. So, you know, I I would go out there and I would come back. I went out when I was instructed to, and I came back when I was instructed to. I did what I was asked to do in the field, whether it was uh, just moving around, trying to uh, make contact with uh, the Viet Cong, or go on ambushes at night, or at one time we were a blocking force for uh, uh, Republic of Korea, we called them rocks, coming down a hill, and we were the blocking force that was there. So you were trying to secure an area? Well, it we were, actually, they were driving the excuse me, the Viet Cong down towards us who were in a, they were on a mountain moving down and we are in the uh, a flat area trying to block whomever happened to come out that way. Okay, now normally did, uh, if they were U.S. forces, did you have a, a, a reconnaissance group that was a point on your movement? Uh, there were reconnaissance groups there. Uh, they weren't necessarily on point for my particular unit they were there in general and they called them LERPs, long range uh, patrols I think is right. what they were and, called. Uh, so, uh, so they were a non-contact group. They so were trying to go out there and check things out and then but not be seen by the enemy. All right, so the, the regional command is using the LERPs to basically locate enemy uh, folks and then your group gets sent out for the engagement? Is that That's correct. Okay. All right. Uh, the, uh, clearly, of course, uh, one of the difficulties is uh, uh, resupply in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, how did that work? Uh, resupply, actually, day was a, a good day for us. Uh, every four days, they would come out and they would bring the sea rations, water, uh, and the number one thing is mail. I think you get two beers and one Coca-Cola or two Cokes and one beer uh, that you had over the course of the day. We would, as, as soldiers, grunts, we would take the food that we liked and we would pack it around. We would take the food that we didn't like and try to trade it with somebody who was uh, in our unit. Uh, everything else we destroyed and buried. Um, and the start of the four days, your pack was very heavy at the end of the four days, you were glad to have uh, resupply because number one, you got mail, and number two, you'd get some food that was more to your liking. Uh, out of curiosity, what are C rations? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, canned rations, I guess. I never even thought of it. <laughs> but it makes a difference in terms of whether you're going to spend a night in the, you know, in the trench with the cold food or the idea of, of actual warm cooked food and is that only going to occur back at the base? No, we had we you, they had a a, a fire uh, thing. Well, shoot, 
Well, but it's not butane. Help me out on that. But like butane. Well, very similar. Okay. But we use C4, which is uh, the explosive. It burned incredibly hot. So we would use that to heat the uh, uh, meals that we ate out in the field, if we could, if it wasn't in a area where we couldn't do that or if it was night. You couldn't do anything at night. So n nighttime, anything that reflects light, you've got a problem? Right. We, yeah, we were not able to do that at all. Did you come under fire at night? Uh, we did one night, yeah. Uh, what actually triggered that? Do you have any idea? Or uh, was we, it just the zone? It was, a, well, no. We walked into an ambush during the day, and then during the night we waited, uh, and then we moved up the hill and uh, were fired upon. Then we came back, and then we waited till the next day uh, to go back up. So if you're going to engage, you want to be able to have your support fire. Is that the idea? Right. And yeah. uh, is it artillery or is it aircraft? What, what are we looking uh, at? The, and again, like I spoke to you, I was not in a great deal of combat. I was in combat, but not a great deal. When we were dealing with uh, the VC or the Viet Cong, when I was uh, over there, we had the, I think it's F-14s come in and bomb um, the particular area we were going to go up into. Okay. Uh, when, uh, when you're back at your base, mm -hmm. you're now with larger units uh, in that structure. What are you housed in? Oh, we're housed in a large bunker, which is, of course, sanded over and, and protected. And just think of a, a warehouse where you have a, a lineup of you know, 60 cots or whatever, uh, the number of cots that they had in there. Does and it have a solid roof? Yes, it did. And well protected, sandbags and all the other stuff that in case there was mortars or things like that, uh, you could be pretty assured that you were safe. And uh, uh, typically they say there, uh, you've already pre-dug uh, trenches to basically, if you're out moving through the base, uh, have a place to recover? Uh, they were built before I got there. Right, but right. but they're, yes. they're present all right. through the... Yeah, there was uh, buildings uh, throughout the, the compound because there was a large contingent of people who lived uh, on the fire base. So uh, they have various duties, uh, communications, uh, some transportation, uh, some helicopter crews, I assume? Right. Well, the thing that I notice now more than uh, when I went in the military is... Now, during the course of a war, we contract a lot of the jobs that used to be done by military personnel when I was in. Okay. So it's a whole host of, of support roles. Okay. Uh, uh, now, you mentioned in a conversation earlier uh, that your unit was not at full strength. No, we were down. And, I, and politically, now I understand. I didn't at the time. Uh, we were getting ready to redeploy, which means come back to the United States as a unit. So they let the numbers go down and then just redeploy the group that were there. It wasn't, we weren't at bare minimum. We had a, a number of people uh, All right, so in if the a, unit. If, if a company is normally, what, 120 people, mm -hmm. something like that, and then you had, what, four platoons inside right. of that? We are probably uh, 85. Okay. 85 people, I think. And again, I didn't know about the other platoons. My focus was very limited. But you did mention that you lost your lieutenant and he wasn't replaced by a lieutenant. No, he was not. And the other four guys weren't replaced either. So it implies that the structure is you'll go with the field leaders that are experienced that are already there? Correct. Okay. And so sergeants become pl platoon leaders? They did in the case that I was, when I was over there. Uh, yes, they did. Speaking of rank, what rank were you? I was E4. And what would that translate uh, in today's special? Fourth? Well, corporal. Okay. Or specialist fourth class. For fourth class. Okay. Um, now, you said also, the, uh, clearly the draft tends to collect people from all over the country, different ways of life, of different communities, and different cultural norms. Uh, is that true in your group? Absolutely. And I think the, the thing that people need to know and realize now is I was going over there to, towards the end of the combat war, and 
many of the people that may have been drafted before because of the political unrest and the dissatisfaction with the war and the fact that they were killing and hurting a lot of people. Uh, the people that I went with, I used to say back in the day, is they were poor white kids and kids of color. And because there was not a lot of, well, they were always all very young. Well, uh, so are you suggesting that there were draft exemptions that actually made a difference in who went into combat roles? Correct. Okay. And uh, uh, so uh, so you're out in the field, uh, yeah. you come back, you, you get what, like uh, how many days in between missions? Well, and, and again, I would imagine it was four. And again, I don't remember. It wasn't very long. And what happens to you when you're back at the base? Well, you, you get to sleep in a cot. You uh, get food that's uh, uh, created in a, what's, uh, hot food. I guess. Okay. Commissary type. Well, it was, I'm drawing a cafeteria kind right. of a setting. Okay. Hot food, plates, uh, silverware. And uh, uh, originally, of course, you, uh, uh, you found yourself with a different type of weapon assignment when you uh, ended up at that fire base. What kind of a weapon did you have? Well, initially I started with an M16, which is the rifleman's weapon. Uh, towards the end, we had a, well, not towards the end, Probably a couple months in, uh, the, the person who carried the M60A1, which is a machine gun, uh, was hurt, and I decided uh, to take that over. All right now, one and of it was the, by choice. Okay, but you're not a particularly large person, and that's a pretty heavy weapon, and the ammunition is not going to be easy. How did you handle that? Just did it. Okay, and and. To kind of give my, I'm kind of a chubby tubby now. Um, basically, I was 135 pounds. The M60 weighed 25. I had all of the food and things that I needed to carry and water, which is incredibly heavy, uh, and ammunition for the 60. All right, and but the just, we just, you know, the expectation was that I had that weapon. I was going to carry that weapon and have it ready to fire if it needed to be fired. Okay, but you go through a lot of ammunition fairly quickly. You can do that, yes. So, oh, I uh, as as well as me carrying ammunition, I had a uh, an assistant gunner who carried ammunition. Even people who were just regular platoon members also would carry ammunition in so, case we needed a large amount of ammunition. Well, obviously, that's a type of a person know that your life is dependent upon. What kind of a character? What type of character? Mm -hmm. Oh, at the time, you know, I, I trusted him, obviously, with my life. And he, when we moved up a hill, we moved up together, um, him feeding the ammunition in and me doing what I did. Okay. Uh, and uh, did you have special designation spots that you were supposed to go to that you knew in advance, uh, depending upon the circumstance? No. Okay. It was just if, if 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 they needed me here, I went there. If the, I was needed elsewhere, I would go there. Uh, I was normally when we were on patrol because you know you're in a in a kind of a modified line. I would for the most part be not the front because that was what you called point. You had point and slack, but I would be towards the front of the uh, the squad. Okay, for fire support. All right, now, uh, one of the problems that begins to occur over time is uh, draftees have uh, started to look at the war as not necessarily their war. Right. And so activities on the base are not quite what you would expect to see in, in today's world. Well, and, if, and I've, I've followed some of the wars since. If you're on a fire base and you're a bunch of 19-year-olds, uh, the things that you do, that uh, I'll rephrase that, things that I did and the group of people I was with did were 19-year-old things or 20-year-old things. And uh, there was drug use in the, in the rear. Uh, the group that I hung with, there wasn't a great deal of drug use. There was a lot of, po I mean, there was every type of drug there that you, you could possibly want. I chose to smoke, I smoked dope, but I, only smoke dope in kind of a limited manner. And I also, none of the people that I worked with uh, 
did any drugs out in the field that I knew of. That's because it's life and death. Yeah. Well, I, I, I yeah. And and you got to be able to depend upon each other in terms of your abilities to react. I assume. Yeah, there are some junkies. Okay. But um, it never came into play. Now. Um, you mentioned uh, that there were different collections of cultural groups that made up your group. Uh, did that make a difference in terms of how they recreated when they came back into the base? Uh, well, if you've ever read the, uh, the book, Why Do All the Black Kids Sit Together? Basically, you go to groups that you're comfortable with. And that was the same there. Uh, you know, you had your African Americans, Latinos, uh, Caucasian, understand that everybody really got along pretty well in the group that I worked with uh, through the course of my experience there. Uh, but they still were more comfortable with people of their like ethnicity. So do you think that that was about their hoping it was temporary and they'd go back to their own world when it was over? No, I didn't. What caused it then? Uh, for just, uh, it's a comfort level. Okay. If you look at the world today, it's much, much better because kids have grown up with a multi-ethnic grouping. And that's what we need. Okay. Um, uh, eventually, you're, uh, you're going to uh, complete your tour of duty. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how do they separate you from active service on a fire base? What we did, and, and again, you know, X amount of years ago, we were given new clothes to wear, new boots, uh, were kind of spiffed up. Because of the drug use, there was serious checking of military personnel before they came back to the United States, uh, you know, strip searches and things like that. I didn't have to go through them, but uh, heavy checking for uh, drug use. We got together as a group um, and started to load onto commercial airlines, Flying Tiger being one, and those are a contract airline, and we flew back to the United States to the, f the base we were going to be stationed at there. We stopped at Seattle, but nobody could get off the plane So uh, because of the drug problem. And where, uh, uh, what base were you? Uh, uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. All right, that's a long ways away from the West Coast. Yeah. So uh, when when you got off, were you simply released at that time? No. Once we, we processed in, we were allowed to go on uh, leave. And I, of course, flew back to Washington State. And at the time, I used a lot of the money I saved in Vietnam, which was a lot, uh, because I sent all of it home uh, and bought a car. Okay. Uh, by the way, did you have R and R when you were? In no, the I did not. I wasn't in country long enough. What did it take to be eligible? I don't know. Okay. Just I probably was eligible, but I I didn't do it yet, and that I don't know the dynamics and the political ramifications of you know gearing down on the war. Well, I can imagine they weren't exactly recommending it if, if the unit was preparing for redeployment. Correct. So I'm no yeah, doubt I'm that well, influenced it. I can, yeah, as a. All right, so uh, uh, you're now back home. Right. Uh, you, you had a goal to go to college. Correct. Uh, what does that now become in actuality? Well, uh, understand that the goal that I had to go back to college was always there. I went to one year of college. I knew I was going back. I went into the military to have the GI Bill to go to school. So you understood that was. I understood, the and that was my goal: is to go, you know, do this, not get hurt, come back, uh, go to school, and finish up, and that's what I did. Well, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Going back to school, there's still mm -hmm. that transition from being in the military to heading into a civilian uh, uh, way of life. Right. And sometimes that isn't always smooth. Well. Look at it the way I looked at it. I was uh, a old man at 20 compared to the kids that were in college at the time, which were very close in the same age, because of my experiences. And what happens when they discover that you are a veteran? Well, some of them gave a shit, some of them not, depending on the group you hung with. 
So, uh, so resistance to the war actually got reflected back in your personal contact? Correct, but only for a little while because basically I stopped communicating about the fact that I was uh, in Vietnam. Okay, but that, that makes it a little tougher for you to actually uh, feel comfortable with all groups. You're, you're oh, going to correct. choose people that you feel to be comfortable with. Oh, as, as we uh, spoke about earlier, I was very comfortable talking to uh, veterans because we had shared experiences. And I think if you watch the news now with those people coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, they say people who have gone to war can understand war, those that haven't really can't. I mean, you can understand it at an academic level, but you can't understand it as it has happened to whomever went there. Okay. Uh, uh, eventually, uh, you, you come out with a teaching certificate? I did. And uh, your target was what? Elementary education. And uh, any particular reason why? Uh, well, I always wanted to teach. I'm, I kind of went between a couple of things. and. Like anybody in college, I took classes and different things like this, and I finally found something that appealed to me as a teacher, and that was elementary education. And uh, now, now you got hired in the Kent School District, is that correct? Yes, I did. And uh, how many schools, or can you just flip out some names of schools that you actually worked at while you were here? Well. Let's reflect back to the military. I was going to school on a GI Bill, and when I graduated from college, the money that I was receiving for the GI Bill stopped. So I graduated in June, early June. I needed a job quickly. I looked for teaching jobs and put out applications and was not hired. I then knew I wanted to stay close to education, so they were hiring security officers for the Kent School District. And so I applied for that and uh, was hired as a security officer for the Kent School District. And I did that for 14 months. Okay. And then you had a conversation with who? Uh, based, well, I was, um, I continue to apply for teaching jobs. I, at the fall of 1976, I uh, had one brief conversation with a principal. I was hired at Grass Lake Elementary. Uh, for fourth grade. Okay, and then uh, what other schools besides Grass Lake? Okay, I taught for 17 years at Grass Lake. I was hired to open a new building with a bunch of people, which was Daniel Elementary. Uh, after Daniel Elementary, I went to uh, do union work. I was a union president for three years, um, also active at the state level. From there, I went after that, I w was hired to do my administrative credentials at Matson. At the time, it was junior high school. And then uh, seven months into that practicum, I was placed as a replacement at Panther Lake Elementary. And that's where I did my uh, administrative work as a principal. Okay. Any other schools you I went to? I, once I retired from... Uh, Panther Lake, I went and taught one full year at East Hill as a behavior disorder teacher, BD kids. Okay. All right. And uh, is there anything from your experience that you'd like to share with us in terms of uh, how you look at life today? Uh, well, I, I think the thing that is probably the most uh, critical is the way I look at war and politically the way I, I believe uh, is different than what it was when I was younger, but it was formed because of what I saw going on. And, you know, Tim talked about earlier the, the issue of who went to Vietnam and who didn't. During the course of the time when I was there, the people who were being drafted were, how can I say this without acting too awful, we were the low, lower socioeconomic. Uh, at the time, people who did not want to go to Vietnam but also didn't want to be a draft dodger went into the reserves. Those people that went into the reserves were guaranteed of not going to a combat situation in Vietnam. I don't believe in most wars now. Uh, 
it, that being said, here we are facing ISIL, and you know it's it's a horrible thing. Uh, but it, unless it's a very clear-cut, specific objective, war is um, it's not good. So and mission, I, and I missions, don't believe in it. Missions being defined as everything. Mi well, overall missions, missions at the at the command level need to be specific. Once you get to the to the level that I was at, and even uh, up to where people were getting orders to do things that were directly related to combat situations. Uh, in Vietnam, once I got out and understood, there was nothing that we could have accomplished that would have helped, well, how can I say this, accomplish the goals that we were setting out for because we didn't have any goals that we had set for ourselves other than to set up a puppet regime in South Vietnam. But we would have had to stay there forever okay. in order to make it work. All right. So my guest has been John Walker. Uh, uh, I'm Tim Clark. And this has been a conversation about Vietnam and its conflict.